you have your Bible with you, go ahead and open it to the fourth chapter. We continue our study of the fourth chapter of Ephesians, and our text will be in just a moment. I'll read it. Um, the same text that we had last week. As some of you that know Didi and I, we know you know that uh, we like to go to New Orleans occasionally, and and a couple years ago, probably probably a year and a half ago, we were in New Orleans. I don't I don't remember exactly how long ago, but uh, we were walking around, and those of you that have been to New Orleans, you know there's a lot of panhandlers and folks that are asking for uh, financial assistance uh, all around, and there's all kinds of reasons that people are on the street asking for assistance, and some, of course, are sort of a scam. Some just have a need. Some uh, are going through uh, very serious problems that we can't really know uh, just by observing. But anyway, I was going through Jackson Square with Dee Dee, and there was one young guy. He was... Uh, Kind of a big strapping young man, nice looking kid, and but in his early 20s, I would I would say, he was going through a trash can, and you know rifling through the contents and and picking up whatever was there to eat. And he was actually eating uh, the, out of the trash can. And I went over to him and and visited with him a bit, and uh, we tried to help him a little bit. But I was I was uh, thinking about that particular uh, sad occasion when I was preparing for the sermon, uh, there's a guy, perhaps again, through no fault of his own, or perhaps he's on that street because he wants to be. I don't know that. Uh, but it was sad because he's going through a trash can and eating garbage. And Jackson Square, again, for those of you that have been to New Orleans, uh, it's in the center of the French Quarter. And within a quarter of a mile in a circle from where this young man was, uh, there are some of the better restaurants in the country, certainly uh, some of the best food, not just fancy restaurants, but cafes and whatnot that have great food. And I was stricken or struck by rather the, the contrast of seeing a guy who's satisfied with eating garbage uh, when uh, there's all this wonderful food around. And, and it caused me to think about what Paul's talking uh, about with the Ephesians and subsequently to you and I. And often we settle for garbage when really God has something uh, much more extraordinary uh, for us. And so that fourth chapter of Ephesians now, I'll read the verses we studied last week, 17, 18, 19, and then we'll continue on there uh, through 20 uh, to 24. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray for the illumination of God the Holy Spirit. Precious Holy Spirit, we do pray you illumine our hearts and minds now as we study your word. We're so very thankful for the clarity of your word, for the truth of your word, and the manner in which you apply the word to our lives. May this be a time of challenge for us, that you would provoke within us a, a love of your law and of Christ, and that we would purpose and determine to follow Christ in greater faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And so, Recapping our discussion from last week, verses 17, 18, and 19, the Apostle Paul here is warning the Christians that are there in the church in Ephesus about the dangers, the threats of the culture there in Ephesus. It was a pagan, idolatrous society, as, as we considered last week, in which the predominant false religion, which was the worship of Artemis, involved religious opportunism, the occult superstition. Uh, it, it, as a matter of fact, uh, was necessarily immoral and encouraged immorality in the behavior of those who would come to the temple uh, to worship. I mentioned that, that there were priestesses and actually prostitution uh, involving the worship there in that temple. Hard 
uh, for us perhaps to think of in a very literal way, but in a very figurative way, uh, that's not so unusual even in churches today. So in Ephesus, we have religious opportunism and greed and all the things I've just mentioned. And since this wouldn't necessarily have involved the majority of the people who lived there in Ephesus, this presented a threat, a danger to the Christians, the church there in Ephesus. Paul was aware of this. He understood that in a circumstance in which the the community or the society in which one lives is predominantly unbelieving and perhaps is given over to idolatry and all the things that, that result from idolatry, uh, that a great deal of pressure would be brought to bear on the Christians, the believers that lived in that culture. He said as much in Romans 12, verses 1 through 2, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. In a few moments, uh, you'll see how this corresponds uh, with uh, our text today. So recall that that temple was constructed for the worship of Artemis, or the Romans would have called Artemis Diana. And it was an extraordinary building, an extraordinary edifice. It was, as I said, one of the the seven ancient wonders of the world, twice the size of the Parthenon. I mean, can you imagine the folks not being impressed by that? Even the Christians would go by there and look at that. They had to be impressed. You and I would be impressed by that building even today. And of course, we've seen impressive buildings. It's it's not unusual for us to be impressed by impressive architecture and, and huge churches. And, and it doesn't have to be a church. You go into a large metropolitan area, uh, area or, or city and you see the, the, uh, the high rises and the, um, and the huge buildings and you're impressed by it. And we're also impressed, whether we want to admit it or not, uh, by powerful financial forces. Uh, the prayer that my brother offered earlier. He admitted that. He confessed that for all of us, that we we do struggle with money in one way or another. And even if we don't consider ourselves to be uh, greedy or are motivated tremendously by money, it's it's kind of hard not to be impressed when you see someone or you're aware that someone uh, has a great deal of wealth. And for whatever reason, whether it's the stuff that they have or, or perhaps just recognizing uh, that maybe in this instance, that person has tremendous abilities that enable them to get those um, uh, that wealth. There's all kinds of reasons that people get wealth, good and bad, of course. But the point is that that people do get impressed by uh, all kinds of things, and so Paul's just recognizing that. And today, our culture and society is not nearly as different from that of Ephesus as we might like to think. I talked last week about the fact that that was part of a pagan culture, or we would call uh, that. Technically, or if we're going to speak with precision, when we talk about a pagan culture, we're talking about a culture uh, that in which the gospel of Christ hasn't really permeated it yet. Uh, they were just at the cusp, the beginning of, of the gospel being spread there. And many have characterized our culture today uh, not so much as a pagan culture, but as a neo-pagan culture. And what they're referring to there, neo meaning new, is that in post Christianity, uh, which even C.S. Lewis recognized the West had moved into a a place of post-Christianity, we have often different kinds of things that spring into the void, and one of the things that springs into the void there is neo-paganism. And so uh, we too are tempted by uh, many of the same kinds of things when you talk in terms of substance that the believers there in Ephesus would have been tempted by. Compelling temptations. Now, not everyone hears perhaps tempted by the exact same things. One of us might be vulnerable to this kind of temptation, another to that temptation, but understand that we're all vulnerable to one temptation or another. In fact, humility compels us to recognize that. And if we don't recognize that, we'll find pretty soon God will show us that we're prone uh, to temptation and even to sin. So we want in all humility to recognize uh, when we see someone who has given over to a particular pattern of sin, uh, we look at that and approach that with great humility. That's exactly what Paul was getting at in the sixth chapter, first few verses of Galatians, wasn't he? When he talked about us 
reaching out and love to one another when we see our brother who's stumbling, uh, recognizing uh, that we are prone to the same kinds of things. Again, not necessarily the specific kind of thing, uh, but the same sort of temptation that leads to destructive sin. The effects of the idolatry of, of Ephesus then, the ignorance, the hardness of heart, the callousness uh, that's described, and the inordinate sensuality and sexual immorality that was common, even in the actual worship of Artemis, is present in America today in perhaps different, different forms. But nevertheless, it's true of America today. We find ourselves being forced into doing things, conforming to certain types of ideas and behaviors. We feel this pressure uh, to do what other people around us are doing. And even if we don't feel particularly tempted to do this or that, then often we are tempted to, real, to go along so we can get along with others. Most folks really don't want to always be in a conflict or a confrontation of one kind or another. And even that presents to us a a conflict of sorts because we recognize in a culture that really is quite antagonistic uh, to God, to the one true and living God of Scripture and, and to, well, His commandments, we find uh, that it's not a neutral culture or society, but rather one uh, that's given over to a certain outlook, a certain way of looking at life. Uh, and when people look at life a certain way, they tend to act on what they believe. Ideas do indeed have consequences. And so we find that we are sometimes ambushed with someone who has a very different idea of one thing or another uh, than we do. And so we're faced with a choice in that instance. What do we do with that? We, we speak up. Do we keep our mouth shut? Do we go along with it? Uh, do in some way, do we give our approval to it? Or perhaps we even jump in there and participate in that sin as well. I'm just being honest that many times we would recognize that we've done certainly in one or any of those things that's been our response, but in too many instances we actually engage in the sin ourselves for whatever reason uh, we do it. It's just that sort of moral and religious climate uh, that Paul was addressing there in verse 20. Look again at the text if you would. But you did not learn Christ in this way. And then moving on to verse 21, If indeed you have heard Him and have been taught in Him, just as the truth is in Jesus. As I read that, I was thinking of Christ's high priestly prayer in chapter 17 of the Gospel of John, verse 17, Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. And there our Lord is talking about sanctification. And then Paul becomes very practical and very straightforward in his instruction in verse 22, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. That's very direct, isn't it? Think of a preacher uh, speaking to you, really directly looking at you and saying that to you. And even though this comes from a letter, uh, we understand that Paul meant it just that personally. Uh, perhaps he's alluding here uh, to the ongoing struggle that Christians have with temptation and with sin. Now you might suppose, as I, as I think about this, I look out and I see some very disciplined, uh, some successful folks, and you've done a lot with your life, and uh, you've demonstrated that you have the willpower uh, to uh, set your mind on certain tasks and you follow up with them with tenacity and perseverance and you've achieved a great deal of success. Most of the folks here are relatively successful and I just described you to some extent, not all of us, but some of us. But understand that if we believe what the Scripture says about that old nature, it's not eradicated by the fact that we have been regenerated by God the Holy Spirit. That old nature continues to haunt us and to draw us back. I think one of the clearest descriptions that the apostle gives us of this conflict between the two natures, that's the old flesh nature uh, and that new regenerate nature is in the seventh chapter of Romans. I have heard other folks, certain folks, I think that, that uh, suppose that this is saying something that it's really not. I take Paul at his word. I think he's being very straightforward about the struggles uh, that he experienced. And this is, of course, an apostle of God. Uh, this was an extraordinary man who certainly was filled with God the Holy Spirit. And yet he's talking about these struggles. Listen to uh, Romans 7, verses 14 through 20. 
For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do, want, do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Again, I think that Paul's being very straightforward about his personal struggles. That really is a confession, I think, that is valuable to us. Ought to be an encouragement as we think about our own lives and the struggles uh, that we have. I had to think of, as I, even as I was reading it just then, about that poor fellow who was who was rifling through the trash can uh, looking for garbage uh, to eat. That's really the same kind of thing that Paul's talking about uh, when we, we have this tremendous food that we have access to, this meal that is extraordinary, uh, but we choose to go through garbage sometimes, don't we? In Ephesians 4.22, just to remind you, Paul wrote that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. Now let me mention three things that are very clear from this passage. The first one, Paul is saying that a person who is converted to Christ will be different than he was before he was converted to Christ. Now, now think about the context. We're talking about uh, relatively new believers there in uh, Ephesus and who are reading the letter. And so, for, so we're, we're really talking about Paul addressing specifically those who come to faith in Christ probably later in life uh, who are adults. And so they had a different life before they were converted. And the same is true today even if someone comes to Christ later in life as perhaps a teenager or uh, an older teen maybe, or as a young adult, or, or even some older folks, and they recognize that their life needs to be different, ought to be different. That's exactly what Paul is saying. In an instance where a child uh, comes to faith in Christ at an early age, this change is, is not nearly as conspicuous or obvious, is it? But in the instance of an adult who is converted later in life, what Paul is saying, I think, hits home. The second point I want to make from uh, verse 22 is the will of a person is very much involved in the sanctification process. The, the choices that we make are important, and too often in the Reformed family of faith, the Reformed understanding of the faith, uh, we sort of disregard the need for us to make the right decisions in life as Christians and, and to determine, to purpose, to do things and to not do other things. I've heard Christian teachers talk about the idea of sanctification as being completely monergistic. That's an idea that, that it's all God only who does it. Only God's work. Now, there's a sense in which that's true of sanctification, but monergism especially applies uh, to justification. But our sanctification is synergistic. In other words, what we, what we understand about our sanctification is it begins with our regeneration and our conversion. And God, of course, initiates this process of sanctification. He actually moves it forward in our life. If it's not God doing it, then it's not being done properly, right? And he actually brings it to completion. And so there's a sense in which God still is sovereign. His grace is certainly sovereign over our sanctification. But we are... We are called to cooperate uh, with that by using the various means of grace that God has provided for us. And so the fact that we are reformed and believe in the sovereignty of God doesn't mean that we don't recognize that the sovereign grace of God has worked out in our lives in very tangible ways. And indeed, through a renewed will, a regenerated will, uh, we are told that we need to make certain decisions in our lives as Christians. This passage, this text that we're looking at today doesn't make any sense if you deny that. If you suppose that there aren't any decisions to make, it doesn't really make any sense. Like Paul saying, saying that we are to, are to lay aside the old self. What does it mean when you say, when you read the words lay aside? It's talking about a particular decision or choice that we're to make. 
And it goes on throughout the time that we are Christians here on this earth. The third point I want to make from verse 22, never underestimate how easy, how easily we might be deceived uh, by the three agents of temptation. You know the three agents of temptation? Uh, the, the temptation of the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's the reform understanding of temptation. That, that often those three agents of temptation actually collude. It's certainly two of the three. Anytime that we are tempted, uh, these collude together. And so we can understand when Paul talks about, uses that phrase there at the end of verse 22, the lusts of deceit. We can understand he's talking about these three agents of temptation uh, working and colluding together. Uh, to cause us to stumble, to present us with one sort of temptation to sin or another. Now, in verse 23, let's look at that. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Again, there's that phrase that calls us uh, to the importance of what we think think about things. And again, uh, often, not so much Reformed folks. Reformed folks actually uh, tend to be on the other side of the spectrum, and uh, we're, we tend to be fairly rationalistic, and we, we uh, think a lot about our faith, and, and we want to think with some degree of precision, not so with many evangelicals. And so often they discount the importance of theology and what they think about God and what they understand about what it means to be saved. Indeed, don't have the vocabulary that we use commonly. I, I just speak as one who, who remembers back when I was a Baptist, loved, loved my Baptist uh, roots, understand that, but I, I never heard the word sanctification, even though it's in Scripture. I never heard a teaching on sanctification back then, and I had a great pastor. Uh, but they just didn't really focus on that sort of teaching from Scripture. I'm making a generalization. I recognize that. Uh, but the strength of the Reformed faith is that we do try to teach in a more precise way of what the Scripture says. So we, we do understand that our mind's important, uh, but sometimes we don't understand just how important it is. We need to think the right and the, the correct thoughts about who God is. If we don't, if we have a, a false idea about who God is, we'll find that we, uh, we end up in a bad place. And so in verse 23, we're told uh, that we would give a central role to our, our minds in this process that we call sanctification. And then verse 24, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Now, five points from these two verses. And these points are either explicitly stated, and you've already heard them really in, in the words of Paul, or, or I see them uh, by necessary inference. In other words, they're implied. The first point. The fact is that our conversion to Christ is a recreation. In other words, when Paul says put on the new self, he's telling us that something new happens to us when we're truly converted. Uh, we want to think of perhaps that uh, verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Secondly, the, 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 the man, in fact, all men are created in the image of God. Did you hear that? All men are created in the image of God. Not just the Christian. All men are created in the image of God. Or in the New American Standard Version that I, that I preach and teach from most often, uh, the word likeness is inserted there. All men are created in the image or the likeness of God. And depending on who, what teacher you happen to be uh, reading or, or studying, sometimes they try to draw a distinction between those two words, image and likeness, and sometimes uh, they understand them as synonyms. And I think largely uh, that's the correct understanding, that they're really saying the same thing. So thinking about that, that all men are created in the image of God, and we, we're talking about thinking about the kinds of things that are prevalent in our culture and society today and the stuff that we see around us, that's sort of a hard thing to swallow. In fact, some of you uh, maybe don't really necessarily believe that. I mean, you understand that good people are creating the image of God, but you think about this despicable person over here or, or that person over there or, or maybe somebody that holds high office in our country, you think, no, that, that person's not creating the image of God. Other people are creating the image of God, but certainly not that, that, that fellow. No, understand that all men are creating the image of God. You must understand this. It's a biblical truth, and if you don't get that, uh, then you'll find 
that all of your understanding, both of yourself as well as your fellow men, uh, is going to be tainted, and it'll affect uh, what you think about particular issues. Uh, those who don't understand that all men are created in the image of God are not going to be pro-life truly. They're not going to be anti-abortion truly. They're not going to be happy that Roe v. Wade is overturned because they'll, they'll fall into the, the mistakes, the bad ideas that, well, perhaps their quality of life would be bad, so maybe the baby's better off uh, to be terminated or, or is going to have this physical problem or that uh, mental deficiency, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, so maybe it's better that they are aborted, and, and we shouldn't really be making such an issue of this. Well, that's, that's uh, what Zig Ziglar used to call stinking thinking, you know? I mean, that's just a, that's a bad understanding of the fact that all men are created in the image of God. We must understand that. But sometimes, as we look at people, we all know somebody, if we think about them, I gave you an example, perhaps you related to it, perhaps you didn't, I know some of you did because I heard you snicker, but some of you probably were wondering who I'm talking about there. Talk to me after the service, I'll be glad to give you more of my personal opinions. You know, I'm never reluctant to do that if somebody asks me, sometimes even if they don't ask me. Huh? But, but you may be looking or thinking about somebody and thinking, well, I'm not sure about the image of God, I don't know, I don't, I don't see that. Well, see, the problem is that the image of God is shattered. You see, see, at the fall, men, Adam and Eve, uh, that image by which they were and in which they were created was shattered by the fall. The fall was a catastrophic thing. And so today, men are born in sin. And so if they're not regenerated, uh, they, they are going to evince less and less of uh, the evidence that they're created in the image of God. In fact, as we think about that, Christians ought to uh, more and more demonstrate that they're creating the image of God, even sometimes though we don't. Now, the question is, if, if the effect of the fall is that the image of God is shattered, uh, what about subsequent generations of men? Well, as I've said already, subsequent generations that are born after Adam and Eve, those are our parents, um, in a very real sense, biologically, uh, all subsequent generations of men uh, share the guilt of Adam's sin and their nature uh, is fallen. We call that that radical corruption, or you might have heard the term depravity, is referring uh, to the fact that that nature is corrupt. Uh, but understand this, the fact that you may not see the image of God in, in someone, you may not even recognize it that often in yourself, it's not obliterated. It's not wiped out. Even the worst of us, we still carry the image of God, though it's been corrupted and and, and perhaps it's been perverted and distorted. Nevertheless, all men are created in the image of God. That's where the sanctity of human life comes from, that principle. All men are created in the image of God. Uh, those fellows on, uh, around Jackson Square in New Orleans that you have to step over, and many of them are, are in a bad way, you know, under the influence of one thing or another. Uh, understand, those people, they, they may not reflect it as they lay there in their, their filth, but they are creating the image of God, and they have worth. You may not especially uh, want to be bothered by them. You know, you go to a city or tourists and whatnot. You really don't want to see that. I, I, I know a lot of folks feel that way. When I go there and see these folks, you know, I just, I'm, I, I, Didi has to drag me away from New Orleans because I think we've got to start a ministry right here. This is where we need to be because these people need help. That's the way that, that, that affects me when I see this. But, but a lot of people don't want to be bothered by it, and that's okay. That's okay. But the point is, this is an important point. Those, those people are creating the image of God. Now, the fourth point, what's that image of God? Well, well Paul gives us kind of a little thumbnail sketch. It's not, it's not in any way comprehensive, but it does give us a peek at what it means to be created in the image of God. Look at verse 24 again. They put on a new self, which in the likeness of God has been created and righteousness and holiness and truth, or your translation may say knowledge. And so that tells us a little bit of what it means to be created in the image of God. That's, that's what it was for Adam and Eve to be created in the image of God, that they shared the righteousness of God they, in their innocency. They, they, they were holy just as God had created them to be. Uh, they had a knowledge of Him. Imagine they... they encountered God face to face at that point and they actually communicated uh, to God in a very personal way. Now they're not gods. They shared these things, holiness and, and knowledge or truth and righteousness in degree, 
But nevertheless, uh, they were created in the image of God, and it was reflected. And what's happened then since then is that image of God has been shattered. Now, we can understand the image of God in one way that's very clear. Those of you who have, who have heard me talk about the attributes of God and the two categories of attributes, you have incommunicable attributes. Those are those attributes that are not shared by men. And then you have communicable attributes. Those are the attributes that are shared uh, by men. And it helps us as we understand, or if we were to go through a list of the communicable attributes, what it means to be created in the image of God, or something of what it means to be created in the image of God. Uh, and these that are mentioned here, righteousness and holiness and knowledge or truth, those are communicable attributes. And so, so we're creating the image of God, and so we share some of the very attributes that God himself um, actually manifests or demonstrates or, or possesses. Not to the same degree, not the same perfection, but nevertheless, that's the truth. And the final point here on this verse 22, um, or 23, this is what sanctification is all about. Progressive, listen to that, progressive, um, that's a bad word these days, right? We're not, I'm talking about really what progressive means. Progressive healing of the shattered image of God in man. In redemption, in this healing, we, we are redeemed from the penalty of sin. But we are progressively redeemed from the power of sin. And if that were not true, then what Paul is instructing us to do there would be cruel. It would be frustrating to us. He recognizes that we can change, that we can make decisions to be different, and we can avail ourselves of the means of grace that God has provided us in particular in the visible church so that our sanctification uh, will be facilitated, expedited. Okay, let me close here with three points in summary. The first one, listen, this is very personal for you. I, I, this, is, this is from your pastor knowing that some of you are struggling, have struggled, will struggle in the future. If you're not struggling now, you know you're going to struggle at some point in the future, right? I mean, I mean that's the truth of it. That's not a Joel Osteen um, truth, but that's the truth nevertheless. You, know? uh, you, can be, you can live in denial for just so long until you get knocked on your face. And, and that's coming for folks because we live in a fallen world. So expect difficulties in this fallen world. There's going to be trials. There's going to be tribulation. There's going to be temptation. There's going to be tests that will come our way. And, and there's going to be casualties. You may have been a casualty of this testing, or you, you may become a casualty of this, or there may be someone that you love dearly that is a casualty now. As you think about them, you think, well, they're a casualty. Just what you're talking about, Pastor. And, and it breaks my heart to think about that person I love who has been wounded by this, this rotten culture that we're living in today. But let me tell you something. Don't, don't bury the wounded. You've heard that phrase before? Sometimes Christians, too often, uh, we bury our wounded. Our casualties, we, we try to get them out of sight. What we need to do is go help them, pick them up, and take them to someone who can help them to a hospital, figuratively speaking, so that they can get some help. Expect that you're going to have people in your family, people that you care about, perhaps even you, you're going to face trials, tribulations, temptations, and tests because this world is falling. The fall was catastrophic. The second point, you can choose to be different in a fallen culture, in a sin-loving society. You, you, you don't have to be impressed with the temple. You know, you, you, you don't have to look at the temple of Artemis and be impressed by it. You really don't. Uh, you can put it in perspective and understand what goes on in that temple. You don't have to go with your neighbors or your friends to worship in that temple. In fact, you shouldn't go to that temple to worship. Now, I'm talking about apostate churches, churches that are less than, than but I'm not only talking about church, understand this. I'm talking about, about all the effects that, that result from from idolatry. You don't have to participate in those effects, my friend. You can choose to be different. And in fact, if you do that, you'll find that God will bless you, perhaps not immediately. You may even have a consequence for that stand that you take, that decision you make. But understand, God will ultimately, as a Christian, He'll bless you. 
I'm not saying He's going to bless you with prosperity. I'm not even going to say that He's going to bless you with, with good health your entire life. I'm, I, I don't think Scripture teaches those things. But I do believe that God's going to bless His children who are obedient. And those blessings may not be evident to other people, but they're real. And they go on through all eternity. And the third point, don't give up on yourself. You know, don't, don't give up on your sanctification. Don't do that. You know, if you've messed up, if you've made serious errors in your life, you can change. You can make a decision uh, to do better now. Now, if you are yet to trust in Christ, you can make a decision uh, to begin to behave differently. And that probably is a good thing, but that's not going to get you to heaven. The first thing that must happen is you must be converted. And the only way a person, including this preacher, is truly converted is that God convicts that person of his sin. He sees just how wretched he is, or to some degree, initially you don't usually realize just how wretched you are. And he gives you the gift of faith to trust in Christ alone for your salvation. He gives you what is called repentance into life. And in the first instance, you know what repentance into life is? Is you quit trying to save yourself. You quit playing that game where you compare yourself to this person or that person and you say, well, I'm at least not as bad as that person. You know, I'm not perfect, but I'm, I'm probably going to make it. You know, after all, God grades on a curve, doesn't He? Understand, though, you must be converted to faith in Jesus Christ. But let's talk to you who are Christians here. I don't know what sorts of mistakes you've made through life. I mean, I know some because you share things with me. I can tell you I've made a whole bunch. I can tell you I'll make more. But I'm never going to give up. I'm going to persevere. You know, I'm just like Peter when, when the Lord said, are you going to leave me now? And say, who am I going to go to? You know I mean, nobody else has the words of life. That's what it means to be a Christian when you realize you have nowhere else to go. And you can uh, continue to move forward. You persevere in your sanctification. There's a, a group that most of you probably never heard of because um, they're not in the Trinity hymnal, I don't think. It's called the Third Day. Anybody here know that group? Matt. I figured you did, Matt. Uh, <laughs> and Bob as well. Well, that, it's a, it's a, it's pretty good group. I don't know all their music, uh, but I remember, and I was going through a difficult time some years ago, and, and a woman that was in the congregation, she, man, this woman had, man, she had so, so many bad things happen to her. I mean, this, this woman had a tragic life. And she had an amazingly, you know, cheerful countenance. It used to amaze me. I figured, you know, it must be medication or something because of the stuff that she was, she was going through. I mean, you know, it was just, just horrendous stuff. And anyway, she was sensitive. That's what, that's what happens when you go through a lot of stuff in your life. You begin to notice that other people are going through stuff too. And so she, she told me, hey, Dick, you know, you, uh, look this song up. You know, l listen to this, this song, Cry Out to Jesus. Uh, by third day, and so I looked it up, and I mean, it was, it hit me right where I was, and it was encouraging to me. You know, don't give up on your sanctification, and, and look to those people and those gifts that God gives to people uh, to encourage you. And I know, I know some of you are having difficult times, or, or have had difficult times, and listen to this. Consider this to be a word from God. Isaiah 43. But now thus says the Lord, your Creator, O Jacob, and He who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you're mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. Through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you'll not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. Let us pray. Our Father and God, we thank you for the truth of your word and the encouragement we find there. Oh, we do pray that we would live lives that are pleasing unto you in conformity to your holy commandments because we understand uh, that what you say we ought to do is best for us. And now as we look forward to sitting at our Lord's table, we pray, Father, you prepare us. Prepare us. Prepare us now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.